deep in the water where no fish hang out lives a glum gloomy swimmer with some ever-present clout. The Hadal snailfish lives where pretty much nothing else can live, the Hadal zone. The pressure and temperature of the water alone make it almost impossible for anything with DNA to survive. And that includes just about every living thing, plant or animal. But with some zesty adaptations and a prepper's supply of extra genes, it's all good in the neighborhood here in life, death, and taxonomy. Welcome back to Life, Death, and Taxonomy. It's your 30 minutes of in- animal in- information. Interesting style. It's been a while. I'm Joe. <laughs> Not for the listener. I'm Carlos. <laughs> and, to, uh, and thank you for listening to this episode. Uh, oh also, a big, goodness. huge thank you to Cassie for the creation of our theme song. To hear more of Cassie's music, please search Cassie Michelle on YouTube or Spotify. And thank you to Johanna for the creation of this week's artwork. To check that out, you can follow, uh, visit us at our home on the web at ldtaxonomy.com. And a very special thank you to our patrons, uh, to Jesse Raspolich, Carol Raspolich, and Richard Kaspar. Thank you so much for your support. It's greatly appreciated. Thanks for helping us keep the lights on. And today we're talking about the cousin of an alumni. But more on that later. Yeah, they got an honorary doctorate. Or whatever they gave yes. to What was it like? Robert Downey Jr. Dr. Worm. (laughs) (laughs) Dr. Worm. Yeah, we've already uh, covered a a similar one, but this this one popped up on the the news. I mean, not... I mean, in Newspeak forever ago, but that was like six months ago. But, yeah. Hmm. What are we talking about? We're talking about the Hadal snailfish. Is it Hadal? To the Mariana snailfish. Hadal? Yeah, I thought it was Hadal. Yeah, it's probably Hadal. Hadal sounds like more like a style of food that's kosher. Halal. What, isn't yeah. it Halal? That's like... Yeah. yeah. Hadal. It's like title. Hadal. Yeah, that makes more sense. It's a zone. But then, yeah, you In have... Osh. Kabal and Halal. All of those like are pronounced like that. I don't know. I just when I saw it, it was like Hadel, but that makes sense too. Yeah, the Hadel snailfish. What we're gonna call here Wilder Gene and Hadel Vice. That's what <laughs> it was. What I <laughs> that's why I thought of that uh, that pronunciation. Hadel Vice. Uh, but yeah. Well, would you like to hear what it's called in in, in science? Yes, please. One science, please. Hadal, yeah. Hadal snailfish. That's what the computer lady says. Okay. Thank you, computer lady. The, do- the domain, if you're into that sort of thing, is you carry Yoda. The kingdom. I care about Yoda. Animalia. The phylum, Chordata, which is surprising if you know some other stuff about this. The class is like of ter- Tergy. The order... Scorpioniforms. Scorpioniformes. Scorpioniformes. Yeah. The family. Lipi, lip, liparidae. 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 The genus is Pseudolip, Pseudoliparis. And so far, we have already talked about all of these things all the way down to the genus uh but the species is not pseudoliparis uh swear swear eye which is what we did before it's pseudoliparis amblystomposis amblystomopsis no not stomp stomopsis yeah stomopsis Amblystomopsis. Yeah. It's a wonderful phrase. 
Now uh, that I'm uh, saying it out loud, I'm kind of wishing I had done uh, nitty gritty nomenclature. But since we're in the business of naming things, it's time for my favorite part of the show: k k k critter groups. Uh, the part of the show where I ask you, Joe, jo a question, and that question is the same every time. What is the name of a group of this animal? Or what is the term of venery? Or what is the collective noun? Four snailfish. If you saw a group of them, would it be A, a shoal, B, a mutter, C, an arrangement, or D, a keel? Um, a mutter or a fodder? Uh, <laughs> me mutter. She was orange <laughs> and me fodder. She was, he was green. Whatever that, that Irish folk song. Me mutter. I'm going to say a shoal. Final answer. That is correct. That's why I wish I kind of done... Kind of wish I'd done nitty gritty nomenclature at that time because pseudo liparis sounds interesting, um, but yes, it's a shoal. It's a fish. It's the uh, the fish scientists are did not really go whole hog on the uh, terms of venery like the ornithologists have. Maybe they are like me and they realize they are useless. But well, we I don't mean, you gotta have to. fun with this. Have a little fun with it. Come on. There's so many different kinds of fish, so many different kinds of birds. Let's group them into their 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 put the little groups in and give them team names, you know? <clears throat> but I wanted to point out something we haven't said on the show. And there's a difference between a shoal and a school of fish. A shoal is when there are a bunch of fish of the same species that are hanging out. They're just doing their own thing to in the same area. A school is an organized formation of fish. Ah. Which I did not know. <clears throat> so if they're all going they the same flock way. They together. Yeah, yeah. It's fish of a scale. School at scale. At, I don't know. Um. They school at scale. That's scalable schooling. Yeah. You can you can have lots of schools because you school at scale. But yeah, it's a shoal of snailfish because it's a shoal of fish. And they don't really move in formation, so shoal is the best one. Would you like to know what it looks like? Sure. Well, sightings are rare um, since they live so they live pretty far down. If you know anything about Hadal or Hadal, Hadal the Hadal zone in the ocean is l l really far down. It's in the trenches. So it's hard to just go and feast your eyes upon it. You're not going to go see it in an aquarium. Uh, but there have been sightings and photographs. The Hadal snailfish looks a lot like the Mariana snailfish which is what we did before. Its body is generally tadpole shaped with large, broad pectoral fins on their sides. Although I th it looked like maybe the pectoral fins were a little bit smaller, but that could just be that the pictures they have of it, they were folded in a little bit. I'm not really sure. Um, snailfish in the family Liparidae have different looks and features depending on the ocean trench they come from. Um, in our case, they... they uh, they're like uh, tanned, like whitish, but they might be whitish pink, tan, orange, or brown, depending on the species. The Hadal and Mariana snailfish seem to be a uniform color, but some snailfish are spotted or mottled or striped. Uh, so they come in some variety, but our guy is um, monochrome. Nice. So that brings me to its size and dimensions in relatable terms. Uh, welcome to the Beloved Measure Up segment, the official listener's favorite part of the show, the part of the show when we present the animal size and dimensions in relatable terms. Through a quiz that's fun for the whole family. It's also part of the show that's introduced by you when you send in this audio yourself saying, singing, or chittering the words measure up into ldtaxonomy at gmail.com. We don't have a new measure up intro this week, and this fish doesn't make any sounds. 
because it's a fish. Uh, blah, blah. So we're going to start. We're going to introduce uh, Measure Up with a little quiz. If you get this quiz right, you can earn 5% cash back on your... Uh, uh, on gas, and by that I mean you can get five percent towards oh, your nursing school victory. It's a discover it card. I like it. Uh, so without further ado, the listener's favorite part of the show. Okay, let's talk about quiz. List. So I was just in Yosemite. So I was thinking about the animals of North America. So list these animals in order from most to least populous in the United States. Okay. Are you ready to hear the animals? Yeah. Black bears, deer, wolves, and bison. I'm going to go with deer, bison... Black bears, wolves. In that, so that's the order. Yeah, with deer being the most, wolves the least. Final answer. Yeah. The correct answer is. Okay, hold on. Wait, hold on. I should say that when I say bice, I'm talking wild animals here. Oh, never mind. Then I'm gonna say deer, black bear. Bison and wolves. Now that is. I don't know. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, fine. Whatever. Deer, 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 black bear, bison. Final answer. Yeah. Deer, black bears, bison, and wolves. That's one hundred percent correct. Nice. There's like millions of deer, millions of deer, uh, hundreds of thousands of black bears, and like. Something like twenty three thousand wild bison, and something like a thousand, like seven thousand wolves, up from like hundreds of wolves. Wolves. It, the, why do we have millions of deer? Because we have not millions of wolves. Yeah, wolves are, but wolves are like insanely dangerous. So, it's we kind of uh, did a good not job really. getting rid of them yeah they are i mean wolf attacks on humans aren't that well there's wolf 7, attack on humans of them. aren't that common because there's seven aren't that common. thousand of them no 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 they're like they just unless you they're very cautious animals but the problem is they kill cattle and when you kill cattle uh farmers tend to kill like 10 of you so that's the problem. Like they don't it, for every one cattle, 10 wolves die. Yeah. Even the Ethiopian and wolf that that's doesn't everywhere. kill cattle. It just looks like it does. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I was going to I I was tempted to think that there weren't any, um, wild bison at all that they were all domesticated but like camels or dromedary camels did I lose you no uh wild attacks not prompted by rabies or inappropriate behavior on the part of the victim are extremely rare when it comes to wolves inappropriate behavior if you're saying a lot of swear words Wolves come for you. <laughs> if you're if you're dressed immodestly. Yes. If you're talking in class. Um so you got five percent. Let's talk length. Nice. They're eight point nine to twenty eight point eight centimeters. I didn't okay. put how many of that is in American. Eleven point three maybe. That's what I have for inches. Yes. Imperial. Uh, so how many had, d how many hadal sna uh, snailfish go into the length of the General Sherman Sequoia? 
Somebody is riding high on his Californian adventures. Uh huh. California adventure. Uh, sequoias are really tall. Here's a hint. Yeah. General Sherman is a sequoia in Sequoia National Park in California. Along with humans and a few birds, sequoias are among the rare species that enjoy fire. Fire is an important feature in the life cycle of the tree, clearing away leaf litter to make way for new saplings. In fact, sequoia pine cones are designed to open in intense heat, allowing the seeds to fall out onto soil. I thought that was pine cones where they would die in general. Perhaps. But if you look at a sequoia pine, they're like pine cone. They're really like tight and uh, closed. Um, Is General Sherman the pine? No, no, that's a the red. It's a redwood that you can like drive through. Right. In California. There is one, but that's not the General Sherman. Yeah, that's a well, the General that, Sherman. That's a red one. And this is a sequoia. General Sherman is a uh, is the largest tree by volume, and I think what that means is it's not the biggest, it's not the tallest, but it's the the it's the thickest of the tallest and the tallest of the thickest. I would say it's seventy feet tall. 74. Uh, snailfish, snailfish go into the height of this tree. Final Sherman answer? Tank. Yeah. The correct answer is 288 snailfish. That is a tall tree. The tree is 275 feet or 83 meters. That is it is a tall so tree, and the, tall. it's not even the tallest. The tallest I'm, one is uh, Hyperion, which is in North California. That's a good name for a very tall tree. Yeah. Uh, Interesting. Wow, that is very wait. tall. I had no idea. We've. I don't think we've really done tree height on this show, and so I had no real frame of reference. I was like. Anytime we talk about like things in the like hundred foot range, I just think of the building we used to work at that was six stories tall, and uh, standing at the bottom and looking up at it, and I'm like, okay, that's about sixty something feet. How does my thing, the thing I'm measuring, measure up to that? And it's like a tree that was, <laughs> you know, a, that was about like fifteen feet tall. That'd be, that'd be. Very, very tall. So I'm going to go with that. But instead, it's like four times taller than the building. <laughs> well, Se- uh, Sequoia National Park, walking around that, it feels like you're in an alien world. The trees are just, you you shrunk. It's honey, I shrunk the kids. Isn't that where they filmed? Trees are humongous. And uh, Star Wars. Return of the Jedi? Yes. Mm-hmm. Ah. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. That's why they probably why they chose it. Yeah. So let's talk weight. Uh, these fish are seven to one hundred and sixty grams, or we're gonna call it four point six ounces. If we average the weight of a black bear to two hundred and sixty five pounds, how many Hadal snailfish go into the total weight? Of all the black bears in the United States. You just told me how many black bears there were. No, I didn't. I told you how many. Uh... Oh, yeah. I gave you a ballpark. So it's here's like a, hint. a couple hundred thousand. There are more American black bears in the United States than there are cookies in the universe. I mean, there are more <laughs> American black bears in the United States, then there are grizzlies in the entire world. One reason black bears do well while grizzlies suffer is that they are more ab- adaptable to human present- presence. 
Gri- grizzlies kill twice as many humans than, as black bears. And black bears can also live in a wider, a wiser variety of food, I said. Uh, like a raccoon. In Yosemite, black bears mo- are mostly vegetarian, eating grass in the spring, berries in the summer, and acorns in the fall. 120 million. Isn't it kind of adorable to think of a a, a, bear, a bear getting excited for, and gorging on a bunch of acorns? What is this, the Hundred Acre Woods? Yeah, but don't they also like berries? Like that from the get go, they were already a little uh, ad- adorable for the for just like oh, they they mostly eat berries because yeah. they're bears. <laughs> Berries. <laughs> it's. I would love it if berries were called that because bears like them. It's a crop just for them. They're just little berries. Uh, <laughs> it's like cereal for bears. Berries. <laughs> uh, Everything's coming up berry. A um, hundred and twenty <laughs> million. Um, Snailfish go into the weight of every black bear in the United States. Final answer? Yep. Correct answer is 276,000. Or no, 276 what? million. Okay. Did I do the math wrong? I th- I thought... Yeah, you- I mean, they're only 4.6 ounces... There are 300,000 black bears. Oh, okay, I put 150,000. So. That'll do it. Yeah. That's just in the US. I think there's like 600,000 or 800,000 in the in North America. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of them are in Canada. Well, half of them. Yeah, a lot of everything. <laughs> everything in in the US, like a lot of there's a lot like there's more wolves, there's more I don't know except if for, there's more bison. There's definitely more moose. People. That's true. There's more people in America. And buildings. There's more Canadians south of the south of the northest point. There's more Americans north of the southest point of Canada. What? More Americans live farther north than Canadians. Oh, because most of them live in on. I think we like, talked about this before. Ottawa and Toronto and Vancouver, and we have a bunch of Americans that live in like Maine. Yeah, well, just like a huge chunk of America is north, and like they have a lot of people live down there in like the Great Lakes region, which is north of the. Yeah, top like of America, Minnesota. I mean, south of the top is, of America quite a bit further Minnesota and Michigan and places are quite a bit further north than Toronto. Isn't that crazy to think about? Uh, that's all I got for that. Would you like to hear some fast facts before we get into the major fact? I sure would. Uh, the, the Hadel snailfish is named after the Hadel zone of the ocean where it lives. The Hadel zone refers to the deepest parts of the oceans in the oceanic trenches, different species of snailfish are local to different trenches. The Hadal Hadal man, I keep saying it like wrong. The Hadal snailfish is native to trenches near to Japan, and uh, the Hadal snailfish is apparently first described by Soviet ichthyologist Antony Petrovich Andreyashev. In 1955, which is surprising considering how deep the creature is. And like deep sea creatures are generally discovered like in the 90s or last year or something. But uh, By James Cameron. And he no was uh, peeping, peeping. Yeah, he's the king of the deep. He's the deacon of the deep. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I guess this guy, uh, Ant- Anto- Antoli, Anatoly was uh, peeping down in the deep. Before or a lot of people, or maybe he just like pulled up a net and found a uh, like a lump of flesh and said, "I think that might be a fish." This snot ball a looks a like pu- a fish. Uh, a puddle of 
yeah. of scale of not even scales. Uh, in October uh, 2008, British and Japanese researchers found the uh, hadelfish, hail, uh, the snailfish, uh, in extremely deep depths in the Pacific Trench in Japan. For a while, it was considered to be the deepest living fish until it was surpassed by the Mariana snailfish. And there is yet an undescribed species called the ethereal snailfish that is said to be deeper. That doesn't make any sense to me. We'll do the trifecta and get them all. Why? How do you know that it's there? How do you know that it's a different species if you can't even describe it, if you haven't even seen it? If you've seen it, then you can describe it. Because haven't s- maybe haven't they only it, got a glimpse know. of it they weren't sure if it was a new species or something else right and they haven't so collected a specimen if you can't name it or describe it or look at it or observe it then how do you know you're not just looking at a different uh, or a, a different member of the same species well it's not officially described so whatever it takes to officially describe an animal Maybe they haven't met those criteria, but they think there could be another fish down there. They haven't filled out the I saw a cool new animal application. Yeah. Uh, But that's all I got for that. I wonder if it's like, look, we've been down to the bottom of a lot of these trenches and they all have its their own species of snailfish. This trench, we haven't found one yet. I bet there's one in there. And uh, if we find it, I'm going to call it the ethereal snailfish. Yeah, it's uh, it's like getting a patent on something you haven't invented yet. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh, so, what we're, we're, do you have a big fact? We are calling this very big fact. Twenty thousand leagues under the sea, or really just, all right, in in parentheses like a Fallout Boy song, just one point four leagues. Um, I actually, when I, when I read the book in like elementary school or whatever, or like the abridged version, thank heavens, um, the, I thought the book took place at a depth of 20,000 leagues, which now looking at it is, uh, 68,000 miles (laughs) or, or three, 359 million feet. Um, it just means that they were under the sea and traveled 20,000 leagues, so that makes a lot more sense. Um, a league is about 3.1 miles. So, uh, like you said, the, the Hadal snailfish uh, lives very deep in the Hadal zone, which is mostly made up of very deep trenches. Uh, and the Hadal zone starts at 20,000 feet below sea level. Um, but the, the Hadal snailfish can live up to over 26,000 feet. So an extra 6,000 feet in there. Just a, just a little little garnish on the top there. Um, but as we've said with a lot of uh, animals that live at extreme depths like this. And by the way, like nothing else really lives down here. Not even plants really. Um, this amounts to... An, in, an insane amount of pressure, which is the main problem that any th- that anything experiences or has to overcome when they live so far down. Uh, yes, the water is very cold. Yes, there it is. You can't see anything. It's too dark. Um, yes, uh, Cthulhu is sleeping b- beneath you, waiting uh, for the day when he's summoned. But those problems pale in comparison to how much water pressure is on you like out here in this in this the the normal everyday life of being not underwater uh we experience one atmosphere of pressure down there the hadal snailfish experiences 812 atmospheres of pressure which amounts to about 12,000 pounds per square inch uh, anything that is not adapted to be down there will turn into a, a point of singularity. That's not true, but like you will just be crushed. Um, so the things that live down there have to uh, have to have special adaptations. One of the main adaptations is hy- uh, hydrostatic 
equilibrium, meaning that the pressure inside the of the water the, and liquids inside your body are the same as outside, um, which is very good because if that's different, then you will either explode or implode. But that's not enough because that pressure is extremely damaging. Um, in fact, it's so much that it's enough to break your DNA. Uh, oh, which is why almost nothing lives down there because everything that lives has DNA. So it, it gets down to the proteins that make up you can be destroyed by the pressure. Um, so the snailfish needs extra adaptations in order to not turn into just protein goop. So first, it has extra genes to replace the ones that are damaged by the pressure. So it can repair itself, Wolverine style. Um, but the second is the more interesting one. It has five copies of a gene uh, that, and this is why I'm calling it gene wild, wilder gene, sorry. Um, it takes an enzyme that is produced by the bacteria, the gut flora and fauna in the fish, and turns it into a compound called trimethylene. Sorry, that's not true. Trimethylene. I know it's super important to pronounce all of the things in compounds and chemistry. So trimethylamine. I'm mm -hmm. sure trimethylene is like in your, you know, in Mountain Dew or something Cereal. like that. Um, but yeah. uh, what trimethylamine, trimethylamine, in my head when I was typing this out and making my notes, it was just trimethylene. That's all I was thinking. Um, you know, trimethylamine. It stabilizes the DNA proteins uh, as long as the hydrostatic pressure is maintained. Um, so basically, the snailfish has a, a lot of its genes dedicated to protecting its genes. Which is something that uh, most other animals don't have. Um, and the reason for this is because it comes at a cost. Like, you only have so many. Uh, and so the snailfish lacks genes for vision, smell, and taste, and instead has n cop copies of copies of genes to keep it alive 26,000 feet below the, the surface of the ocean. So, um, but turns out vision, smell, and taste just really aren't that important when you live at the bottom of the bottom of a trench at the bottom of the ocean. It's kind of just, you eat once uh, a quarter, <laughs> once every three months, and you didn't really, I mean, you didn't need to taste it, right? It's food is food. You're just trying to get, you're just trying to make it to the next <laughs> a couple of months. Um, and to try to fall? Of course, you can't see it, yeah. And, uh, but it, to, to me, it reminded me of the, like, sci-fi spaceships. That only that have like this very odd limited source of power that can only power a couple of things at a time to pull peak capacity. So it's like divert power from the shields and put them in the thrusters so that we can go faster, or <laughs> divert them from the thrusters and put them in the photon torpedoes to send an extra explosive package their way. Um, which is not really how electricity works, but. Uh, it is, it's always fun, but basically, yeah, that's what I was thinking when I was reading about the snailfish. It's like it divert genes from the eyes and the, and the tongue and the olfactory senses and put them into not dying, uh, all the time. So it's they're like, like the put, Krogans or the Klingons. They have redundancy. Like the, the Krogans have redundant organ organs yeah they, they found what keeps them alive and they stuck to that <laughs> they doubled up on that yeah all and that that's extra all stuff needed. empathy uh <laughs> sense of smell music sense of style they didn't need it um although i know nothing about the klingons i do know a little bit about the krogans um of course, a lot of this stuff about the snailfish needs research. As we mentioned, 
in the blobfish episode and in the uh, Mariana, the marinara snailfish episode. Um, studying deep sea fish uh, pretty much has to be done down in their neighborhood. Otherwise, they will explode, which is not great for scientific experiments. Uh, observing them in their natural habitat. I'm surprised they don't like create a like a a, a fish tank with you know super reinforced glass or whatever and um, recreate the pressure. Pressurize it. And so like go and bring that down and capture one of these animals in this hyper pressurized thing see, have the robot seal it and all that stuff and then bring it to the surface and you should be fine and then you can look at this super cool animal that's supposed to be uh, a portable hyper pressurized water chamber sounds really hard to make yeah but so does a a submersible robot that can make it all the way down there and not break so if they can make that they should be able but to that's make pressurized chamber. that's regular pressurized that's not pressurized that's that's maintaining pressure. That's not like. Uh, I don't know. Water. I'm not saying, I'm not saying it's the same. Water. I'm just saying that the level of effort that went into making the submersible is probably similar to the level of effort it would take to just to, to create it. And it, uh, it's more. It's yeah, but we about made like submersibles in war. We were trying to throw nuclear weapons and not be killed by nuclear weapons when we made submersibles. But so, making a, 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 a war sub and making and making something that can go down in the Mariana Trench, like that's a diff, it's a whole different level of engineering. <laughs> True. Um, but the ball was rolling. Yeah, we were already headed in that direction. And it's also down. <laughs> below. <laughs> oh, but that's all I got. That's all I got. All right, that was the Hadel Snailfish. So, for you out there in podcast, you stock up on some of Uncle John's old-fashioned trimethylamine. Route all genetic power to the repair bay and then go further than any fish has gone before. Like the Hadel Snailfish, you're in life, death, and taxonomy. Hey Taxonomy Titans, I just want to remind you that we now have a Patreon. Patrons can see full video episodes and get shoutouts on the show. But ultimately, it's a way for you to help us cover some costs and get even better. Still, reviews are the best way to help us grow. So if you haven't left one yet, we'd really love to hear from you. As always, thanks for listening and engaging. podcast <laughs> if you uh if you can't taste or smell or see you're really not going to develop any hadal vices <laughs>